Okay, I have hit record. I think we should wait just a couple more minutes because oftentimes people are just starting to arrive right around the designated time. Okay, Annette, why don't we get going then? Okay. Tell me when you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Dave Eckert, and um, we're here to talk about the Crescent Valley Native Arboretum at the high school. And a couple of uh, logistical points at the beginning. Uh, we will be recording this. So um, my recommendation is that you turn off or, or you, uh, you turn off your audio and video. And so just have it as um, mute and uh, turn off your video um, so we don't see you, um, but you can see the screen on your computer. Um, we're going to have questions uh, and answers, but that will be at the end. So um, I have a long presentation um, that I can get through. Um, uh, and so I'll get through it and then we'll have uh, qu questions. So when you see something, please uh, write down your question for yourself or enter it in the chat. And then we'll um, hopefully if you enter it in the chat as you think about it, then um, that will work best. Otherwise at the end, you could ask it live if we have time. Um, so like I said, my name is Dave Eckert and uh, this, I am representing two different organizations. I'm wearing two hats today. And I'm wearing two hats. One is the uh, Sierra Club hat and of the Mary's Peak group of the Sierra Club. And the other hat is the Corvallis Sustainability Coalition for the Water Action Team. So we have two different organizations that have been working on this Arboretum and are uh, co-sponsoring this um, presentation today. And like I said, uh, we will be recording it. David, you might want to remind people about how they can minimize the... Um... Right. Okay. If you want to uh, minimize having all these pictures on your screen, um, go up to where the thumbnail is. Uh, generally, that'll be on the right somewhere. And you're going to see a whole bunch of symbols at the top. And you can either go into the general black area and move those around like to the lower right or lower rest, left part of the screen or you can simply press the minus sign on the left of that. And if you press that, you'll just get a much smaller screen with no pictures. And you don't have to watch me then. You can just watch the PowerPoint. Um, if you use the others, you'll see it'll take up more of the screen and less of the PowerPoint and will block words and pictures and things like that. So thank you. Um, so let's get going. Um, first, what is an arboretum? An arboretum is a botanical garden, and it's mostly trees and other woody plants, but it obviously can have perennials, uh, annuals, other herbaceous plants in them. Um, but the thing that makes an arboretum different, it is a subset of a botanical garden, is that it involves education, that the principal point of the arboretum is education. So you can have a native arboretum, you can have a fruit tree arboretum, you can have an oak arboretum. Uh, I could go on forever, but I think you get the point. And this is an aerial of the uh, Crescent Valley Arboretum. So what is a native species? Uh, what is native? Well, a native uh, in the definitions we're using, 
are that threefold. One is that it has locally evolved here in this location for over 10,000 years. And that's since the last, uh, the end of the last age, ice age, that might have been 13,000 years ago, but that is when the habitat really changed uh, in, in a major way. So everything we call native has evolved in this location for at least as a species for 10,000 years. Um, another thing is, as in part of that, is that it's locally adapted to the uh, non-biological conditions or abiotic, which means like rainfall in the winter and drought in the summer, types of soils we have, a lot of non-biological conditions like that. And the third element is that the species has locally integrated with other biological communities, such as local flora, fauna, fungus, bacteria. Um, we, we call the biotic. And um, so a non-native is one that hasn't locally integrated and it could literally take over or it could just die off. So what is a native arboretum? It's a combination of those two. It's an education-based education botanical garden focused on Corvallis native trees and shrubs. And by the way, we do have some, some perennials in there, herbaceous plants also. So where is this? It's at Crescent Valley High School, which is off Highland Drive, about a mile or so north of Walnut. And you have to go over a couple of big hills and it's a gorgeous valley. And you take, uh, you go to the school and turn left and go to the, the west end of the parking lot and turn right to where the location says A. And there'll be a baseball field on the left and, um, uh, at the end of the, what's that, the northwest corner of the parking lot. And you'll see our arboretum there with the sign you saw at the beginning of this PowerPoint. And the most interesting thing about this is that it's right next to Jackson Creek. And we wanted this to uh, have an interaction with a waterway. And so it is adjacent to Jackson Creek, which was, goes right in the middle of the campus. In fact, between buildings, it's an interesting design there. And um, so uh, we'll get back to that in a minute, but that the Jackson Creek connection is critical for, for the uh, value of the, uh, one of the values of this arboretum. So what is Jackson Creek? Jackson Creek is a, uh, a good sized creek that flows not only from the highest source of Dimple Hill, but other places around like Chip Ross Park and Fraser. Um, uh, well, uh, parts of McDonald Forest, and it flows down to the Jackson Fraser wetlands. So you can tell it, it meets up with another creek called Fraser Creek and becomes the Jackson Fraser wetland, which most of you have been to. But once it leaves there, it drains into two separate creeks that go two separate directions, but they end up within a half a mile of each other where they drain into the Willamette River. And the two creeks that leave um, Jackson Fraser end up just upstream or just south of Hayek Park in Albany or near Albany. So um, this Jackson Creek ends up to be a very long creek. So what's the value of a native arboretum on not only this schoolyard, but on any schoolyard anywhere? One, it provides an outdoor classroom for multidisciplinary purposes, everything from sciences to the arts to the social sciences. Um, and I'm sure, that, oh, and also, also like wood shop comes in like in those benches and there's a, a, it, all kinds of um, different um, disciplines can be brought into, the, into working with this native arboretum. And it, this, uh, this also helps the Jackson Creek ecosystem and any other schoolyard is in a watershed. So you can talk about their, oh, their arboretum. It also moderates the microclimate in the schoolyard. Schoolyards are generally buildings, pavement and grass. And that's it. And occasional tree. Uh, this is throughout the United States. So this, uh, an arboretum, even a small one, really helps the microclimate and cooling it down and uh, holding moisture, things like that can go a long way. And finally, it's a gathering place, a respite for students, teachers, uh, visitors, 
and this is and this is located between the athletic fields and the school and so people out in the sun and athletic events can go here. So how did this start? It started in 2009. It was a concept. And you can see the, the location of where the concept went. And the goal, the stated goal was to regenerate a diverse native schoolyard ecological system serving the educational and cultural needs of the school system. So we have two systems, an ecological system serving the school system. And it was, again, purposely put next to Jackson Creek. So for three reasons. So it, it could retain, help retain summer groundwater, which could refeed the stream in the hot, dry summer months. It reduces excessive summer creek temperatures by providing more shade if not directly to the water in the stream, but the land around the stream, because all of our streams get too warm in the summer for fish only because they don't have trees around them. But if we put the trees in, the creek temperatures don't get that high. And finally, it provides habitat for aquatic species. And keep that in mind that many aquatic species uh, migrate from aquatic to the atmospheric and, and terrestrial areas such as the insects. And an arboretum next to uh, a school, as we said, provides both a convenient outdoor educational site and relaxing environment. So who was our, our principal sponsor? The principal sponsor was the Mary Speak Group of the Sierra Club and the only sponsor at the beginning and that uh, initiated it. And we, we have to thank this group for doing so. Um, so what did we do? Uh, we had a number of steps we did to make this happen. And before anything happened, uh, even the proposal, uh, we did a pre-Arboretum land survey and walked around it, looked at it, and we found on this site, dominant, it was dominated by turf grass, that's it. And it had two dying trees on it. You can, if you look hard, you'll see them. And it had an inhospitable fill soil that, in, that one portion of which included beach sand, which we didn't find actually until later. And that used to be a volleyball court that was sim, uh, a sand outdoor volleyball court that was covered by turf grass. That, that was quite a finding. So step two, well, no, part of step one is looking at the soil. We found a number of things. It needed more nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon. It had very, it was very low in fungal mycorrhizae, which is critical to plant growth, and soil microbes and arthropods, which are also critical to plant growth. And it was heavily compacted, and it it it, it would be a hard hard um, soil to grow for trees to grow in. So we had to consider all of that. But step two, then, we had to go through an approval process. And the first thing, we had to come up with a concept design, which you see on the right. And that was with the help of students doing that. Um, and then we had to come up with a list of plants. We worked with students on that. We had to go out and get a list of sponsors and managers who would manage the place and who would sponsor it, meaning fund it um, and take responsibility. And we had to have, and that's the funding sources, we had to have an installation plan, not only when, but how we we're going to install the, the, um, the Arboretum. And like I said, that also includes a timeline. And we had to have a maintenance plan because um, the school didn't have the funding to maintain a different kind of an ecosystem. And so we had to absorb that and we had to prove to them that we could do it. And we had to have a part of the plan was what if we don't do it? then what happens? And so that was all part of the plan. And we secured initial funding uh, for the trees and the shrubs and all the other materials we had to get um, through these five groups, the Mary's Peak Group of the Sierra Club, Corvallis Oddfellows, Watershed, uh, Willamette Watershed Productions, got a grant from Northwest uh, Clean Water S Associates and a grant from the Benton Soil Water Conservation District. Now this was just the initial funding. And two teachers, I'm telling you, if you have work with schools, you have to have teacher angels. And we had two wonderful teacher angels, Peg Cornell, who is still a teacher there, and Jenny Davis, who now teaches, who was at uh, Crescent Valley and is 
now at Sheldon Middle School. Without them, literally, this could not have happened. Um, and then uh, um, once the school district did approve and had to go through a, 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 a detailed uh, approval process, um, the real work begins and we come out with more detailed measurements uh, to make sure that we are doing what we said we we're gonna be doing. That's uh, actually the school surveyor there. We um, had a consultant uh, to make sure we were doing things in the most appropriate scientific manner. And um, uh, we got the donated time of Dr. Ed Jensen. Uh, he's emeritus. Uh, he was at OSU then, now he's emeritus. And he's author of an ongoing book that's it just got republished re in a new edition, Trees to Know in Oregon. The picture here is the last edition of it. And Ed's a joy to work with, and he's going to give a talk with us in the fall. Um, step three, then, is we had to regenerate this healthy soil. Uh, this soil was horrible, and most school soils are because of the turf, pavement, compaction, all that stuff, just the nature of the usage. So after a lot of detailed research, we decided to try lasagna mulching. Yeah, how many people here like lasagna? Well, we all do. But it's a special technique, which you can see them in process right there. And so what is it? Here they are again. So it's a no-dig technique. It mimics natural soil building process, but does it a lot faster than, than it would in the woods. And it consists of layers of high nutrient organic material that will decompose into healthy productive soil. And it will help, help to loosen the compaction and increase the biota in the soil. Um, in the, what are the layers? Well, generally uh, it, it can be many different, lasagna mulching or sheet mulching, it's also called, can be composed of many different types of materials. What we chose, was one, the existing grass that's there and the grass and weeds, I should say. Most people remove those, they spray them, they backhoe into, they do something to remove it. We leave it all that there because it becomes nutrient. We understand about the seeds, but the soil already has a lot of seeds. So we weren't worried about the weeds. Um, they were already there, no matter what we did. And um, so we left the grass there, didn't touch it. We laid cardboard. We got a lot of cardboard. We laid straw on top of that and composted mulch on top of that. And we did layers. So we got our cardboard from local stores. They would even bundle it for us and would come with a pickup truck and these big bales and pick up, pick up the cardboard. And we asked for the largest pieces of cardboard they could get. We went all over town doing this, um, food stores, uh, appliance stores, furniture stores, and bicycle shops are the best. Uh, we Then we laid the cardboard down. When I say we, students, teachers, parents, uh, volunteers from the uh, Mary's Peak group of the Sierra Club and the many other groups, the Oddfellows and many other groups. Uh, it was a big task. Um, and then um, what we did is um, that what the, the cardboard does is it inhibits the grass and weed growth. It holds it back for a while and it decomposes uh, the grass and, and, and it covers the grass um, and both the grass and the cardboard become nutrients. And, um, and the cardboard adds needed carbon. We generally just think of nitrogen and phosphorus, but it also needs carbon, it needs to turn into soil carbon. And all of this gets consumed by soil animals and microbes. So the, the population explodes. Um, and that's important. Um, so the straw was donated by a farm. It was the straw they no longer needed. In fact, it was um, decomposing uh, to the point it wasn't useful to them, but that, that decomposing straw was very useful to us. And a com local company called Coast Range Refrigeration used their big truck, volunteered it, picked it up at, the fa at Stalford Farms and delivered it right to us. It was wonderful. And then we uh, laid down the... Um, a, that straw layer on top, we just took the little pieces of the bales out and just laid them down. We weren't, um, we did not uh, separate all the straw. We just laid it down in bunches, as you can see there. 
Um, and then Republic Services were, was very kind and donated a lot of mulch. So this would have cost a lot of money, but they liked working with the school district. They will not donate it to you or me or, or a lot of operations, but they really, really wanted to work with the schools. And um, so they, these, this is just one of about 20 deliveries that they came with us. And that's a huge truck. That's not your normal pickup truck. The camera didn't do anything odd there. That is a huge truck of, of mulch, heavily composted. And we took that mulch and laid it over the straw. You can see right there, see the students working. And I tell you, the students were having fun. They were laughing, they were talking, they were working hard. It was really inspiring. And here they are again, more composting. And here they are again uh, with, it, one of the, with Peg Cornell, one of the teachers. And so it took about five months for this to decompose before we planted. Uh, so we knew we were gonna plant in November. So we had to back that out to the spring to put the mulch in. And it provided a lot of food and habitat for the animals, the small animals, soil animals. And, it le and when it did rain, it uh, leached into the soil. So it, it goes deep into the soil. It doesn't just go at the, stay at the top layer. Um, and so in November, step four was to plant the trees. And we buy our trees exclusively from, and shrubs exclusively from Seven Oaks Native Nursery. This is not a plug for them. I love these people. These, this is right across the river. It's close in. It's a wholesale uh, nursery in which all their native plants are grown from, grown from locally collected wild seed that has the local DNA. When you buy a native plant, you're generally buying a native species. But often when you go to a nursery, those species come from places outside of the Benton County or the five county area. They generally come from elsewhere uh, and are shipped in to retail places. I'm not, I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying it factually. But when you get from Seven Oaks, you know, and they'll tell you, we got those seeds from Benton County or we got them from Lynn or Marion or Polk or Lane County. You know where the seeds came from. And that's essentially unheard of. And we love that because we want the local DNA that's adapted to this local um, uh, microclimate. Okay, so step, uh, again, in the step that we were now, it's we're planting, remember? And here is the first tree that's planted. It's an oak tree. See the arrow points to that thin, it's, it's about, it's a little over six feet tall, but it's really a small tree. And if you look in the middle of the picture, way in the back, there's a woman back there. That's, uh, that's the superintendent, two superintendents ago, Dawn Tarzian. She was a huge supporter of ours. And we had the superintendent, assistant superintendent, and the principal who are all very supportive of what we're doing. And the kids and teachers were, Wonderful. So there we are. You see Annette over in the left smiling. And uh, one of the teachers to the right, whose name I can't remember. I don't know if she's still there or not. But they all worked on this. And more teachers, more students were planting more trees and more trees and more trees throughout and more trees. And it, the level of excitement was, was very high. And then we had to protect the trees because there's deer. And there's also people who may not realize how fragile they are, uh, the trees are when they were first planted. So we put posts up, many posts, three posts around each tree and put, and put a, a fencing around it. The next step was we took, we, um, uh, we put in trails and we laid down again, another layer of sheet mulch, <laughs> but this time we do cardboard or thick paper and we'd cover it with, just with wood chips and then would border the trail with logs and logs were donated by Tim Brewer Tree Services. And I'm just uh, heartbroken. Um, uh, Tim just passed away this week and that was a big deal. And he really helped us so much on this Arboretum and I just wanna honor Tim Brewer and acknowledge him. Um, step seven is, um, wood benches um, that uh, were made from locally milled um, three foot thick raw dug fir. And, um, and we poured concrete foundation, secured metal posts uh, that were made locally. They were, they were uh, welded locally. 
and secured the bench tops to the posts around so people have a chance to sit and enjoy the place. Now you can see right now they're out in the sun. That is not the case anymore. Now, Brad Probst of, of the uh, Coast Refrigeration um, was the person who locally milled the timber coming from his own, own uh, tree farm out in the Kings Valley and he donated them and delivered them out and it was just wonderful. I mean, Brad's a great guy. And the, the, um, the posts, that's right, I didn't mention, were fabricated by the metal shop at Crescent Valley. So you can see them there, um, uh, how, you know, the design that a student came up with and then they fabricated them. And so this is all student work. Step eight, we give trail names, give a sense of place. If you don't have cultural identity or a personal feeling for the place, you, it's hard to appreciate it. So it's a student project that worked on naming these trails and getting the signs made. And you know, I can't emphasize how important that is to have student and teacher buy-in on this project. Um, so how, what were they named? Now, I'll go through this process. The decision was that because it's a native arboretum, the, na the, um, the names should be native. The Kalapuya are the native people to this area, stretching back as they say to time immemorial, but we know from, is at least over 500 generations. It's a very long time. And, um, and, uh, and so um, I'll talk about the acquisition of the names, but these are California names for native plants that are along each trail. Anafu elderberry, Anquakwa is, uh, is ocean spray, Anpup is alder, and these plants Native plants were used by the Californians, still are being used for food, medicine tools, daily use technologies, and cultural practices. And the names were given to it, provided by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron linguists. And um, they, so it was with their permission to use those names. And the displays were funded, because there was money involved, by both the Mary's Peak Group of the Sierra Club and the Corvallis Sustainability Coalition Water Action Team. Uh, we also put up interpretive displays that are there uh, about, about the place itself. What is it? What is this arboretum? And what about, what are native plants and what are they about? And, and what have been the, the land uses of this specific piece of land where the arboretum, arboretum is from 1851 to 2008? So what's the final step? The final step is we keep working. We've been working now, we're in our 12th year, really, from the planning, and we're still working on it. The Mary's Peak Group and the coalition are now the two primary lead uh, co-sponsors on this. And you can see the students still planting. This is, uh, this is just recently. And we always plant, by the way, generally in November, December, late, at latest in January. Um, and additional plants from year to year, uh, we try to plant plants every year, are, are continuing to be funded by the two organizations I just mentioned. Um, there are student assignments every year through different classes that they use. And um, I only have a small collection. I haven't received all of the assignments, but I've received some of them. And they're really well done uh, on what the students are doing. Some of them are more virtual on design or planning or conceptualization, or and then some are in ground. They're actually installing things or maintaining things or making alterations. And um, so it's uh, it's very encouraging to see how it's being used. Uh, maintenance is a big deal. And we do have to rely both on students and the school community and our own volunteers. If one doesn't work, the other picks up. But we absolutely need that sharing of, of, of uh, I hate to say responsibility, but the joy of doing this. And it's pruning, it's raking, it's laying down more mulch, it's uh, caring, uh, observing and caring for the plants. Um, and um, we have an extremely high survival rate of these plants. It's, it's, 
and the fact that this is such horrible soil and was, it's no longer horrible soil. We've probably done 100, 100 years of soil development in 10 years. And with no chemicals, <laughs> no, no purchased fertilizers other than just having mulch. Now I wanna show you that picture on the left that I showed you before. It's, um, the, uh, you see the oak tree on the left planted in 2010. Look at that same tree. Um, it says 2020, I'm not sure that may have been 2021, but um, 10 or 11 years later. And, and Mike who's in, in that picture is about six feet tall. And that wasn't any fancy picture taking to make the tree look bigger. bigger. That is the size of the tree. And oak trees normally don't grow that fast, but because we had, we, we created such lush soil and it got such the correct care, um, it's just growing faster than I've seen them grow in the wild. Um, by the way, Amayafa is the Kalapuya name for oak. I just love that. I didn't even, I, don't, I have it recorded how it's supposed to be say, said, but I'm not a linguist, Amayafa. And you see the spelling. And Amayafa has such a nice sound to it. I, I love it. Okay, so let's look at a couple of the, um, that the current or last, actually these, this picture was taken last year of, of the Arboretum from different uh, viewpoints. This is from the um, uh, east, the school looking toward the west or the baseball field. And of course, those signs aren't up there. I, those are put in virtually. I just wanted you to know what some of those plants are that you're looking at. And some of those are, have been uh, categorized as some of the best specimens in the mid Willamette Valley of, the, of these plants. And this is just after 10 years. An example is the coyote bush. Uh, we have a lot of blue elderberries and you don't see that many blue elderberries anymore out in the wild. And we have a, we have a lot of them there. Um, this is from Jackson Creek looking up from, uh, toward the parking lot, which is to the south. And this is looking um, from the school batting cage building in the school um, baseball field toward the school, looking toward the east. So when we started, conceptualizing with the students and the teachers and the administrators. In 2009, the students were between 14 and 18 years old. And they all actively and enthusiastically participated. Those students, former students now who are former students are now 26 to 30 years old to give you, a, you know, a sense of the time that's passed and thinking of that we're continuing to work with students and they continue to, um, uh, to graduate and leave, but they come back and they look at, and this year we had an OSU student who was a sen graduating senior come out and help us. And we talked for a while and I said, well, where'd you go to school? She said, oh, I'm from Corvallis. Oh, where'd you go in Corvallis? Crescent Valley. I said, I said, you went to school here? And she said, yeah, in fact, I helped you back in 2013. I mean, and it was, Wow. So what do we have now? We have a calming canvas gathering place. Those benches are now in the shade. It's a buffer between the school and the athletic facilities. And those are two very different aesthetic features between the school and the, and the athletic facilities. It provides outdoor educational opportunities it provides scientific research opportunities. And it provides a physical connection with the native plants and the language and the people. And so they're not just book learning, there's a physical, physical connection. Now, Barry Wolf took this picture and this, he, he, we were extremely close to this white crowned sparrow that was in an, the blue elderberry. I mean, not this close, but I mean, within like six feet. And that bird was really protecting 
his or her place in this um, elderberry. And this is one of our many elderberries in there. And it was just a great moment. And it just kept watching us and we watched it and neither of us bothered each other. Um, the, the fertile soils are, the, the, the formerly infertile soils are very healthy now. We have a greater bi biodiversity of flora and fauna and fungal growth and, and microorganisms. It's a native habitat. Birds are all over the place now here and all kinds of arthropods. Um, there's great food sources. We don't need bird feeders out here. We have the, the plants that provide the food for the birds and the insects at the right time of year with the right protein and nutrient balance. So, and they're not disease spreaders like feeders can be uh, uh, that, that you buy those you know, when all the birds go to one place and share their diseases from different species. Um, native, so in, um, is, we have something which has Native American food sources here. Um, we're conserving water by the soil that we created here and the plants which capture the water and filter the water are there to retain water right next to the creek where that water is most needed. And the shade, shade that cr uh, created by all these um, trees and shrubs um, reduce the high summer creek water temperature and the, the local microclimate, um, atmospheric climate also. So last year we held our 10th anniversary uh, celebration. There weren't many of us there because that was really, uh, it, it, it was still, you know, pandemic. It was, you know, and, um, but we had a new sign or we don't call them signs, we call them displays. We had a new welcoming display at the front put in. We had a great one before, but we um, had a new one put in and had a little celebration uh, uh, with uh, Peg um, Cornell is on the right, um, who was one of the uh, founding teachers of this. And we have the um, uh, some volunteers and we have the sign maker there also and the person who funded the um, sign, a display, sorry. And the display was designed by um, senior <laughs> uh, display maker in town, uh, Brad Johnson, and funded by one of our volunteers, uh, uh, ex superior our volunteers, I say Lynn Larson. And uh, so this is a great, and if you notice, it has the Crescent Valley um, colors and, and fonts, uh, because Brad Johnson designed the whole indoor gym uh, art design and all the colors that were used in there. So he knew how to work with Crescent Valley High School. So I encourage you to go out there during non-school hours and experience a native sense of place, the Crescent Valley High School Native Arboretum. And that's the end of my slideshow. I'm going to um, stop the share, uh, the share screen now, go back onto regular screen, and I'll see if there are any, uh, uh, ask Annette if there's any questions in the chat. And if, um, when we finish those, we'll see if there's any live questions that you wanna ask. So thank you for watching this. It is recorded and we'll let you know when it's available. So if you ever wanna share it with other people. Alrighty, so. Here we are, Annette. Is there? Do you have any? Turn on your uh, microphone, Annette. And is, are there um, any questions um, related to this? No questions. Just some kudos. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll look at those kudos later. And thank you very much. Um, if you have a question, turn on your uh, microphone uh, uh, and your and your video, and raise your hand. So. Um, I, we can, I can see you and, um, and call on you and then you can ask your question and then I'll make, some, make up some answer. Anybody? I don't see where I can raise my hand, but can you I hear I hear me? somebody looks like it's Dale, is that right? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, I noticed you had nine bark listed in there and I was always under the impression that that needed some some uh, moist areas. Is it down near the creek, or is it doing well up away from the creek? Well, it's it's um, it's it's both. <laughs> it's it's near the creek, but it's in an area. It was on fill land. Um, 
all of that area where the school was built was on wetland. Uh, it was a former wetland and it was back in the day where you could just go in and fill it. <laughs> and so it was filled. And so it's raised about um, two to three feet above the native elevation. So you're right. It generally needs more moist land, but we packed in so much mulch and let it, let it work its way down um, that it retains a lot of moisture naturally now. It has so much organic material in there. Um, and, it's, and, the, and the organic material has leached down into the soil, into that hard pack rubble. And, um, and they're surviving very nicely. They're doing great. great. Very right, David, good. There, there are a few questions in the chat now. The first one is from Bailey Payne, who's the sustainability specialist for the Corvallis School District. And hey, he, Bailey. He asks, are there any materials that you need to support the continued work for maintenance? Yeah. Thank you for asking, because <laughs> you can supply them. We always need mulch. We always need wood chips. Um, we um, always need um, facilitation in um, the maintenance of things like benches uh, because the teachers change and I'm not, I'm always not sure who the shop teacher is and it's good to have an introduction. Um, and they're always very cooperative, but it's always nice to have a, somebody that's in the system like you, Bailey, who can just introduce me to the shop teacher and say, Hey, why don't you help this guy out? <laughs> it's really for the school, and uh, they and because they already came out in 2014 and um, rehabbed the benches, did a great job, um, and they need it again. So, um, and another thing is, um, and I'll just say this uh, that um, the schools do updating. I mean, they have to renovate and they expand and things like that. And when um, when they're going to expand and move into, some, we have six arboretums. When they move into the arboretum areas and need to take out some trees, it's really good if they can let us know. And we can go in and if we have time in November and pull them out and, re, and move them somewhere where. So that communication is one of the best things that the schools could do is because I, I, I don't really pay attention that much to other than the Arboretum. I don't know what's going on in the school. So I know I, I just heard through the grapevine that another school is um, has to remove some trees and um, we would like to remove them and, and um, put them in another place in the school property. And um, so I don't know if that, I hope that answered your question. So there's another question here. Okay. Paul Schlegelman has asked, are there any issues with insect or other pests? Well, um, let me start by saying I don't, I, 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 I don't want to make sure that I've, I'm, impl I'm implying that insects and pests are one and the same. Uh, without <laughs> insects, we don't have our trees. Um, we don't have our shrubs. We don't have our perennials or annuals. Um, uh, we, we have had some problems with fungal problems and with some uh, arthropod insect problems. Um, we generally um, look to ourselves that whether we did something wrong in weakening the tree or the shrub. Um, we look at the soils. We look whether we watered too much. We didn't water at all. Generally, we don't water at all after the first year. But sometimes uh, that is necessary. So we look at what we're doing first. Um, we we talk to try to talk to experts over at OSU or Extension about the insects or fungal growth to see if there's something we can do. We don't, we don't use any chemicals. Um, and um, uh, we've had a little bit of problem with our alders and we've had problems with our cascara. Those have been our biggest problem. There's, oh, and madrone um, is the other Pacific madrone. Um, we think we know the issue with madrone. We're not sure of the other two issues. Um, our cascara has grown wonderfully at the Sheldon Middle School Arboretum, and it's grown terribly and literally died at, at the Crescent Valley. And there's a reason we're not sure what that is. So uh, we, again, we don't use any additives. Uh, we just look at if there's something with our, our behavior that has caused those fungal 
growths or insect growths. And also, um, if the tree isn't supposed to be there, then it's not. Then we just plant something else and work on. But overall, it has not been a big problem. Thank you for a good question. So the next question is from Margaret Foss, who's on the Sustainability Coalition's Education Action Team. And Margaret, Margaret asks, any plans for expansion to other schools? What are the limiting factors such as maintenance, funding, et cetera? Yes, all the above. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the biggest limitation is schoolyard property that's available that will not be built upon. And you know, the, it's not like schools have a limitless amount of land. Um, what we have done, we have planted six uh, schoolyard arboretums, five in public schools, one in a private school. And we really, really want areas that are not going to be built on. And so that's what we talk with. And we have to get a, a land, I can't remember what it's called, Bailey will know this, it's a land use approval. Um, and it goes through the principal to school administration. Um, and, and everybody looks, well, is there a plan for this to be used? And so Crescent Valley was a little, was unique in that it had a clump of land that we could use. And um, that was good. In our other ones, we had to think creatively how to do an arboretum. So each of our arboretums look radically different. And they, but they may have the same plants, but they're designed differently. Like uh, Francis lives next, who's on here today, lives by Sheldon Middle School. That one we did in what we call tree circles. We had a, we had one tree surrounded by one um, species of shrubs, and then the next tree circle had a, um, uh, another, a different species of tree with a different shrub that was a complementary shrub, shrub growing around it. It's a, it's a wonderful arboretum. In fact, we're going to be giving a presentation on this at noon this Friday. So because you see today doesn't mean you wouldn't appreciate Fridays. It's done very differently. So it's actually more interesting to see how a difference can be made. And in each school, it's different and it has to be designed that way. Unfortunately, we haven't been fully successful because um, you know po school populations change um, uh, in, 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 um, interests change, demands change. And so on two of the schools, they've had to actually take out parts of the arboretum. Uh, one, they've already done that. Another, um, it, it's in the planning process. So um, we have to work with the schools and that's where the communication comes to keep, at, you know, we have to move the trees or replant them somewhere else. Um, it, it, at Jaguar School, we had to plant along a fence line. So it's a long, it's a linear arboretum. It is, you know, it's not in tree circles, it's not one, one big area. Um, at Linus Pauling um, Middle School, it was an existing arboretum that they had uh, in a courtyard. And so what we did, we amplified that for, for the uh, wonderful teacher there, Mr. Rose. And um, and so we worked there and we put signage and helped on the trails and uh, it was already an existing wonderful arboretum, but we improved on it. And um, um, at Garfield, um, we lost that one in total, um, but it will be recreated um, with the new development in a different place. So if you are working with one school, I would um, talk with me, contact me. I'll tell you if we have one there or if we've tried to have one, like we tried to have one at Adams School and we had it all planned. And just, just before we were ready to start, um, it got nixed, not because of the school, because but because the city was gonna do a project on school pro property. Um, and that was where we were gonna do it. So that would be an ideal place to right now. We ha I have not done any communication. The education action team could really work with us on finding a place. That's the number one thing. We can get funding, we can get volunteers, we can make it happen only if we have the place. So that's our job first, let's do the concept. That is a good question, thank you. Next. Yeah. So Dave Rabinowitz, who's uh, active 
very active in the coalition, yeah. uh, says, what's the next step? Um, well, on the, I'll, I'll narrow that question to meaning the Crescent Valley Native Arboretum only. And the next step continues to be ma maintenance, upgrade, and work with the schools on usage um, uh, by the students. Uh, we had one of the teachers on here. I think she had to go back and teach a class now. Um, and, she, and, and we have a great relationship on working there. She's having her students take our Arboretum and they're gonna expand it in, into the, rip, the actual riparian zone of Jackson Creek. And so we're meeting next, I don't know, I think it's Tuesday. I'll have to look at my calendar. And, um, or maybe it's tomorrow. It is tomorrow. Uh, it's tomorrow. It it's tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, we're, uh, yeah, yeah, tomorrow we're meeting. And um, so it's, it's expanding. I mean, I didn't do that. She did that. And so that, that is where I want, that's where the next step is. I really love it when the schools step up and they take full ownership. And I mean, we'll, we'll be there. We will be there. But it, these always take some maintenance and they all take some refreshing and they all take um, reconnecting with the students. Because remember, there's new teachers, new administrators. We've, we're on our third superintendent since we started. We're on our, I think, third principal since we started. Uh, we've on, been through countless teachers and the students are only there four years and they're all wonderful, but we have to go through them and we have to reconnect. So it is, we have to uh, make it sustainable because it's a con constantly transient situation. Thank okay. you, David. Good question. Okay, we, we only have about eight minutes left and we still have questions coming in. So oh. on this next oh, good. Good, good. one is from longtime coalition supporter, Signa Dandler, who asks, is the Arboretum, and we can see you, Signa. Yeah. <laughs> is the Arboretum open to the public, uh, say for photography and reference? And if so, what times? Well, um, they have done nothing to restrict us and I've never seen them restrict anybody there, um, but I, I would go only during off school times. I would not go up there while school is in session. Uh, I'm, you know, let's say I will implore you not to go up there during school sessions. Weekends are a great time or evenings like right now when there's light uh, is a great time to go up. I hope that helped. All right, so we have a couple comments from Bailey Payne. Uh, he, he's first, he says, it'd be fun to eventually do a trees to know tour, perhaps with Ed Jensen. He will do it, I promise. <laughs> it's a great idea. And then, um, yeah, I don't know if anybody else has something that they want to just, um, you know, call out a question. Be nice to hear from another voice other than mine. Just turn on your audio and start talking with a question. Or a comment is fine. So Paul Schlegelman says, great presentation. Thanks for putting this together and sharing with us. And, and I would echo that, David. Thank you so much for your leadership and all the work that you've done on the Crescent Valley Arboretum and on all of the school arboretums that you've spearheaded. It's been really fun to watch these evolve. Well, it's been fun to do it and thank you. And um, thanks for coming on. We'll get you out of here before one o'clock. What a deal. And well, and uh, hopefully be, see yeah, folks come on, on Friday. Uh, yeah, remember we're doing another one on Friday. So please do watch the one on Friday. There, it will be different. It'll be surprisingly different. Thank you very much. And Net has recorded this. We'll <laughs> let you know. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye, Francis. Bye. I'm not sure Francis Bye, wants to leave. I think I know. Francis is staying. <laughs> we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Yeah. Um, but um, yep. Hi, Julie. Hi, Suzanne. Hi, if you're Julie. Still there. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Talk to you later. Okay, I'm signing off. <laughs>